Oh, I wish I had this microphone outside. <laughs> All right, I sound a little more hoarse, but I'm very excited because... <laughs> I'm excited for you because I'm excited to introduce two women here who have experienced a lot and been reflective in their own careers and have really transitioned into being a part of everybody else's stories by being coaches. Uh, Jane Horan is not only a friend but whom I consider to be part of my support network as a mentor and a friend. Uh, she has written numerous books on just what it is about uh, your career and coaching, what you should be thinking about. She came to this even, and, and I'll have her tell her story, but she came to this overcoming adversity and she turned lemons into lemonade and damn, a lemonade stand <laughs> to boot. So... Not only an author, not only an executive coach, but really somebody who's been a very thought-provoking leader in the discussion of how to be a better self and how you can be better in your newsroom office career. Abigail Croft is an executive coach with Dramatic Difference here in Hong Kong. And as I was telling many of you earlier, this is uh, executive coaching company and a executive coach leader who charges thousands of dollars for really one-on-one -on -one sessions, something that is almost priceless. So I don't even want to put a value on what you guys do because what you do is really guide people to be their better selves. So without further ado, I introduce to you Abigail Croft and Jane Horan. Okay, I want people to raise uh, hands. Who's just starting out in their careers? Okay, who is mid-career? Okay, and who is just, hey, I'm good, but I'm just hanging out, whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jane, tell us, um, tell us your story. Tell us the lessons that you learned, and tell us the lessons that you can impart a little bit before we kind of get into the one-on-ones? Well, first of all, um, I was just sat at this other the panel before this on the disaster reporting, and I, I just think that was the most amazing panel. Can you all hear me? Oh, okay. And, um, and so I just need to, I think we just need to kind of take a breath and and reflect and transition into this one because you go from war reporting into careers. It's a, it's a little different segue, isn't it? Um, so thank you for being here, uh, inviting me here second year. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I do what I do. And um, it's a little bit of a personal story, but it's a little bit of what I saw inside corporate America. And I just full acknowledgement, I used to work for CNBC um, when it first launched in Asia. A uh, very interesting experience being the head of human resources. Uh, does anybody work for CNBC in the audience? So it, it's a great company. I just don't think it's a great job for human resource people. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I, um, I started out in human resources, went to learning and development. And what I noticed, I, I actually had a question of why do some people get ahead and other people don't? And I, th I wanted to go back to school to study leadership because I saw certain people who I thought had it all not moving ahead. And so actually, I'm, I want to pose a question to all of you. Are careers ser serendipitous? Do they just happen or do we plan them? And I think that would be an interesting discussion to have. So I decided to go back to school to try to figure this one out. And, and, I, and I, I really focused on women. And, uh, and I looked at Asian women inside corporate America, across Asia Pacific, trying to figure out why, why do some get ahead and some don't? And it was in that capacity where I started really looking at careers. And I, instead of leadership, I learned a whole lot more about careers and how you think about your careers and how you navigate your careers. And so that's, that's the sort of the work that I do now. 
personal story why I do it. Um, had a great career at CNBC, Disney, and then decided to move uh, for another company. It was a consumer products company. Within six months, my job was made redundant. New country, new, new role, new company, didn't know a soul. And so I decided to, at that point, it was a wake-up call to think, well, what do I want to do? And I really didn't want to go back into corporate America, and so I decided to start something on my own. And it was in that process and studying uh, women leaders that I developed a process on career navigation. So that's my short story. Great. Abigail, how did you come to this? This today, or? Yeah. <laughs> So I come here today um, as part of a company called Dramatic Difference, um, where I now work as an executive coach and a facilitator. But the first chapter of my career was in careers. So I worked in executive search for over 10 years in Europe and then spent the last five years in Asia. So the work I do now is heavily influenced by my experiences across industries, at the more senior end of the market, working with people who were really looking to assess where they were, where they wanted to go, and that real understanding of some of the challenges faced. But the thing I'm particularly passionate about is individuals and individuals' potential and the power that comes from leveraging your passions. And I'm sure you saw this a lot. You see so many people in corporate anywhere, America, Asia, Europe, who are going through the motions in a career that doesn't necessarily appeal to who they really are and therefore isn't allowing them to be at their best. So the work I do now is really, really focused around that, getting really clear about who you are, what you love, what are your individual strengths and passions, and then really harnessing them to create a career that doesn't just follow somebody else's corporate roadmap, but that really helps you to be your best, your most authentic self, and in a career that you really love, which I think is, is one of the keys to being in a career that you're really good at and, and you become very successful at. What but are the amazing. things that we should be thinking about? What are the guidelines to starting that conversation with ourselves? Yeah, I mean, and I think that can be one of the toughest the toughest things to, to start because we do get quite conditioned. Sorry, I'm not very used to speaking with one of these. <laughs> you do get quite conditioned to follow a certain path, to do what's expected. So I think some of the criteria is to really strip back, even if it's just temporarily, the expectations that you have on yourself or other people have of you and your career and just ask yourself a few questions. And they might be as simple as, what are the elements of my current career that I really love? If I could come to work every day and do the things that I enjoy the most, what would those things be? Just to get uh, in touch a little bit with what, what do I actually enjoy? What am I actually good at? What would I like to do more of? And what are the things I would like to do less of? And then that can open a huge gateway of shaping your own career on your own skill sets because you're giving yourself permission to do things that you're going to ultimately be your best at. Same question. Um, you know, this is an interesting one. Uh, I um, work inside organizations to, there's a real push for diversity inclusion and a real push for multicultural, multiculturalism inside organization and sort of building up millennials and building up multicultural environments and certainly gender, right? So when I go into companies, They'll, it usually, the organization will usually say, can you find out what they, meaning all of you, want to do? Which I think is an interesting question to ask me, to ask you. And so when I say, so tell me, what is it that you really want to do? What do you think the answer is? I don't know, exactly. I don't know, or, pardon me? Yeah, I have lots of options and plans, and then comma, and it's not here. Like they want to leave the, that company, right? So, so, so what I try to work on is how do you figure out what that is? And I, I actually think there's a lot of us who are stuck in that, I don't know what it is that I want to do. And so I, when I was doing this research on women, what I, what I look at is pivotal events. What were some pivotal events in your life that made you decide to do what you're doing now? 
and, and what were the decisions you made, and who kind of influenced you? And, 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 and I start off from there, and this start from get, taking you back to answer some questions on decisions that you made, directions you took, and then from that go through a couple other processes to get really deep into some past experiences to look for the future. Um, I really do believe that if you look at the past, and actually, you know what, this comes from Steve Jobs, right? He, in his commencement speech, he said he looks back, he looked, looked back on the past and made connected dots. And if you look back on your past and these experiences and the feelings that you had, then you can start looking at the future and going, okay, now I get where I'm going. So that's the work that I do is how do you get unstuck? So you're saying that the roadmap is already there. You just have to look for it. I believe that. <laughs> I, I do believe uh, it's inside you. Yeah. But sometimes I believe you get messages, like you were saying earlier. So, so, I, so I, do a, I, I work here in Asia. Uh, I've been in Asia for 25 years. And I will often have a lot of young Asian talent come to me saying, I really hate what I do. I'm in finance or I'm an engineer and I went into this career because my parents said I should do this, right? And so about mid, mid career, whatever mid career is for you, it could be young 20s, it could be 30s, it could be for some people, it could be 50s, then there's a point where you just, you realize I want to do something different. So, and I do think it's in you. I just think you need to dig for it. All right, let's start digging for it, Abigail, with your help. Um, let's do a little exercise. Everybody take out a piece of paper and a pen, if you could. And um, Abigail's going to walk you through some things, some questions you should ask yourself. OK. So if you were to sit down and start to ask yourself some questions around, what do I really want to do? Whether you're at the very beginning of your journey starting a path or whether you're along a path and thinking maybe I want to kind of make some changes, it doesn't really matter. You would ask the same set of questions, but you have more or less experience to leverage. And for me, I think the starting point is to really get in tune with what, what you want as opposed to what you think you should do or what other people expect from you. So the first thing... I would say is quite key, is to cast off anything that starts with a should or other people want for me or expect from me. And then to really start getting a bit creative. So you have carte blanche to use your imagination to the max. And there doesn't need to be any, is this possible, is this not possible, how would I do this at this point? So you'd have to worry about any of the logistics, any of the feasibility, any of the cost analysis. Just literally get back in touch with, if I could do anything I wanted to do, what would it be? And you might not know the labels. And here's the, here's the point. It doesn't matter what it's called. It doesn't matter the university you should have gone to. It doesn't matter the skill sets you need. What's really key is to start tapping into what would it involve? What, would I, what are some of the things I would be doing? What are some of the skill sets that I really, really enjoy using? And one of the most powerful questions to ask, and this might sound a little bit simple, but is, what do I lose track of time doing? Or what would I voluntarily spend my Sunday afternoon doing? Or my Tuesday morning doing? Or what did I used to want to be? And there will be clues in all of those things. And that's the first process, I think, to really ask yourself some of those questions. And then once you've got some of those things down, start to ask yourself why a little bit. So why is it that I enjoy that? What does that give me? Why is that a skill set I think I'm good at? Why is that something I enjoy spending time doing? What is the, what is the more detailed skill sets behind it? What are the emotions that come from it? And that will be sort of the very, very start of a roadmap. Because my belief, and it sounds very much like it's Jane's belief too, is that you can make anything you want materialize. You can have the career of your dreams. But the thing is, not many people tap into their dreams. So if you don't get the visual, if you don't get the dreams in place, your roadmap is so much harder to navigate because you don't know where you want to go. And you don't have that sense of freedom and creativity and belief that you can be whatever you want to be. So that's one of the first things that I would say to think about. 
And then from there, you know, there, there are follow-up processes that I'm, I'm sure Jane can talk about in a bit more detail. But that's how I would start. Jane, why do you think that people lose sight, track of what impassioned them to begin with and then slumber into this sterile state of existence where we're getting a paycheck and we're paying our bills, but we're just in place? How do we get out of that? How do we even get there? Um, I, I don't know. I think that um, you're probably this is a good question for all of you, but I, I think it comes from um, what we get into, right? We we think we know what we want to do, and we go to the either go to school or take a, a go to college or whatever, and, and do a program. We think that that's it, and then we think that this is the company that we want to work for, and and we're going along just fine. I think things change. I think there's a macro. Something happens, you grow up, the organization grows up, and, and maybe you haven't thought about it in advance um, that, well, I need to do a little bit more changing. I need to, that's why I ask this question, are careers serendipitous or are they planned? And so in my coaching experience, what I've found is, uh, speaking to somebody, they'll say, I, I'd like you to coach me, and here's where I want to go. Right? So they've got a definite plan. But with a lot of other people, it's, I'd like you to coach me, and I have no idea what I want to do. So I think those are two different variables, and that could be what, what gets you off track. But I, I'm a little bit like you. I'm, I'm forever the optimist. I think if you just dig deep and try to figure it out and think, okay, let's do a different plan, rather than having your organization decide, oh, oh we're, we're going to go through a redundancy, and now you don't have a job. And then that clear reality makes you think, oh, now I need to put that in place. What do, what do I really want to do? So I'm always a believer in trying to be one step ahead of that, being a little bit more strategic, um, and being adaptable. So I, I don't know if it answered it, but that's, I, I, I just think we need to think about it a little bit more than just serendipitous, or let things happen. Well, Bloomberg and uh, uh, Lloyd Blankfein did a, uh, interviews over the weekend. We um, aired on Bloomberg. And one of the most interesting things that I think really I think is a basis for all of our current state is he said, I got fired. You should try it sometime. And it was just basically where life became inconvenient. And don't we all just love convenience? Because we don't have to think about it. And we still get to eat and go to sleep on a, in a warm bed with, you know, food in our belly. Um, but then life throws you a curveball. What happens afterwards? Are you ready? Are you flexible? If you were all fired tomorrow, think about how that feels. It will suck big time. But then the next day comes. How are you going to feel? You have two choices. You can continue to be in your current state of sadness and fear, or you can do something about it. Abigail, how do you start this mental exercise of what if I was fired tomorrow? What can I do about it? How do you start that exercise for all of us? Well, I mean, it's a reality in today's career landscape that people will have multiple different jobs and work for multiple different companies. Whether that's by your own choice and navigation or because of decisions made by your corporates, you know, who knows. But I think how you view it will be key, you know, because as you said, um, people that have been incredibly successful have failed very spectacularly on many occasions and you know being sacked could be viewed as a huge failure but it can also be viewed as a huge opportunity getting something wrong failing trying a path and it not being the right one for you can be a positive if you choose to view it that way if you choose to pull the learns from any given situation you know and i think if you get fired and 
you're devastated because it's the job you absolutely love doing. You know, there'll be an level of introspection that needs to happen. What has caused that? You know, is it down to inability? Is it down to circumstances? Is it down to a mistake that given a chance I wouldn't make again? You know, and then you might have some, some clues as to what you want to, to find in your next position. If you were fired because of complete incompetence, you know, maybe that is, is a chance to, to think, is this really a job that is using my strengths and passions and capabilities in the best way? You know, so, so it, can be, it can be a great catalyst to really assess where you're at and what you want. And again, you come back full cycle then to, to trying to tap into what that is. And, you know, if you get fired from a job you want, you know what you need to kind of look for in the next job. If you get fired from a job that you hate, there can be some cause for celebration there because you perhaps didn't take the ownership for the decision. You know, you perhaps sort of carried on you know, in the comfort zone, paying the bills, living for Fridays at 6 p.m. and dreading Monday at 9 a.m. And, you know, you can, you can make a different choice at that junction. Jane, why do not enough of us take risks? Why are so many of us afraid of failure? How do we turn that around? I don't know. I don't know if we're afraid of failure. <laughs> um, I... Um I don't know. I, I mean, I think it'd be a great question to ask ask the audience. Are you know, are are, are you risk takers, and is failure such a bad thing? Um, in my research with women, um, I asked that question. I didn't ask about risk. I I asked. Tell me. I I'm a qualitative researcher, so I do it all through storytelling. And I would say, tell me about some early influences in your life. Tell me this. Tell me. And then one question I would ask is, tell me about a time that you failed. So if I'm asking a group of 40 or 50 women across Asia Pacific, these were Asian women, what do you think the response was to tell me about a time that you failed? What? Never. I never failed. Now these were women, and not at the CEO level, but just a little bit below that. So I do think there's a bit of, um, it was either I never failed at anything or complete silence, right? So you could say this was, I'm a researcher, why should they bear all to me, right? I wasn't their family member or friend. I think there is a, a cultural difference on the word failure. You look at Silicon Valley, we wear it on our sleeve, oh, it's great, I failed. How many times you failed? I failed five times, I failed 10 <laughs> times, and yeah, that's what we wanna hear, right? So I think this gets into the differences between what leadership, how it's defined across different cultures and, but this, this was my biggest mistake in my research, and it led to my most powerful learning experiences, and this is where I got to pivotal events in your life that may or may not be failures, but they're pivotal events that, that, that link to who you are today. So I think there's, um, I think we sometimes are schooled as not to fail, uh, be the best, be perfect, study hard, work hard, but that's not the way life is. So I don't know if it's a fear of taking risk or actually there's lots of research that women are more risk takers than men. Mm, I love it. <laughs> yeah, there's a really um, interesting statistic actually when it comes to careers and career risk appetite. And a man will um, apply for a job that he has about 10% capability for, he'll give it a go. And women, particularly women in Asia, would view that they would need about 90% of the capabilities to even put themselves forward for the position. And I think that, that links to that risk appetite and that willingness to give it a go and fail, but I've, I've moved forwards anyway, or that resistance to risk and that need for the path to be certain. And whilst I'm not saying either stat or either position is right or wrong, I think somewhere in the middle is probably where we all want to be aiming to be with our risk appetite because you learn so much from failure. Well, the Silicon Valley, they say they're all permanently beta testing, right? So they never get to the final position. Everything is always in a beta testing phase because you learn so much from the bugs that mm -hmm. come out before the thing is, is completely finished. By the time it's finished, you're bored of it and you want to move on anyway. So that's kind of the sweet spot. Yeah. We should all be in beta. Yeah. We are all in beta right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll share a recent anecdote. I um, had a very high accomplished um, 
girlfriend who is, you know, been given an opportunity if she wants it to do something extraordinary. And I said, well, do you want it? And she said, well, I don't know. I was waiting for her answer. If I can do it, I mean, I don't really have a lot of experience. And I said, stop. I said, if you were to have said to me, well, it's not the right time, my family, this and that, that's a different answer. But to your point, Abigail, she was waiting for 90%. Yep. When somebody already saw her extraordinary ability and said, actually, we want her. Somebody already made that judgment. It wasn't even her putting herself up. It was her either accepting it or not accepting it. And she was saying no to the opportunity because she was editing herself. I'm going to open it up to the crowd. One on one, here's your opportunity right now. Hands up in the air. Who wants to go first? Uh, go first. Tell us what's happening right now, how our executive coaches can help you. Well, my name is Che Pancho from Seoul, South Korea. And I'm working as a freelance journalist recent days, but two months ago, I worked as a reporter from the Wikitree, which is a South Korea SNS-based news service, but I read Wikitree in April because I don't want to be stay only inside, try to focus on SNS. I want to be go to the broader area like here in Hong Kong or the other kinds of Asian countries to meet some people. I like to cover that kind of many developing stories and I like to introduce all kinds of these stories onto my Twitter. So am I doing right? Am I doing right for my next future dream? And after I go back to Seoul, South Korea, what do I have to do for taking my own next dream? And what's the next step for me to do? I need some advices on this. Thank you. Well, well so I, I'll answer the first one. I think, if you, I think the first question is, what is it that you want to do that maybe you need to answer? So I, I think I heard part of it that you want to be more of an ext, uh, international journalist rather than staying in, in Korea, right? So I think if that's it, then you've made the right step. I think, too, being on Twitter and, and you, you being on many platforms of talking about what you do is perfect. And the third one is when you go back is try to start looking at what agency you want to work with. Is it an agency in Korea? Or is, it a, is it an international agency that you want to work with? And then finding a network that like this one that can make the connections and introductions for you because you've already started to get the experience. There was one thing I want to add to this. There was a the beautiful story before, which is a little bit different on the war reporting. Kevin Stiles, I believe, talked about finding a fixer, right? My advice to all of you is find an advisor. Find an advisor that you can reach out to with exactly that same question. We always talk about building networks, and I do think that networks are really important, but a lot of people I talk to, they're like, I'm so tired of that network word. But if you find somebody who can give you a sound advice, and again, I'm going to go back to my research with women. All the women I interviewed, had a web of advisors that they spoke to about making decisions on their careers. And, and a lot of you will get this in the room. So there was one woman I interviewed from Taiwan who was made redundant, actually, in the middle of my research with her. The first person she called, her 94-year-old grandmother. The second person she called was her father. So her, and her web of advisors was family. And this was the difference that I found with Asian women and Western women, is that their group of advisors had a lot to do with family extended families. So I would I'd get five people that you can talk to, very diverse, and put them on, build your own web of advisors to ask these types of questions. Jane is on my web of advisors. <laughs> All right, hands up. Next. Hi, my, my name is Penny. And uh, I want to ask a question because uh, eventually everybody will be facing the same qu type of question that I'm going to ask you now. Um, I'm having a great career and I can want to continue having a great career well into my 60s, 70s and 80s, especially now as people are having to work longer to fund their retirement. But what I'm finding is there's a lot of prejudice in the workplace against, say, people over 40, 50, 60, um, especially when it comes to um, headhunters, and Abigail, perhaps you can help me on this. How can um, 
you get your CV past the recruiter's screening process for a start to tell them that you've got a lot of energy, passion, um, focus, and wisdom, and you can make a really good contribution. Uh, so I just would like some advice on that. Okay. Um, I understand that the challenge there, and it's something that I find extremely frustrating about the career landscape, that you sort of, you have your, your point of maximum appeal in your 30s and 40s, and then typically it can be a little bit harder to make transitions, and people end up staying in jobs for, you know, the last 10, 15 years of their career because they're anxious about whether they would be able to position themselves, you know, correctly and competitively for something new. My advice is when you start to build up a real wealth of experience, one of the dangers when you're putting forward a profile can be that it's got so much on it, it can be hard to see what is the real standout contributions. And this is where some level of specialism or a real focus on your skill set can be advantageous. Because there's a real difference between somebody that's got 30, 40 years of experience, but it's kind of very, very broad and somebody that can bring to the table a real contribution in an area of specialty. And then people are happy to employ you well beyond the age of retirement because you really, really add value over the general market. So that's the first thing, a level of specialism or something that really differentiates you. And I think the other thing that's really key if you want to stay in rapidly evolving marketplaces is to really, really focus on keeping your skill set fresh and current and up to date. And depending what industry you work in, you know, that change will be, will be at varying different speeds. But my experience is so many industries now change from year to year. And to stay relevant, to stay able to contribute and compete, I think there has to be that personal accountability for my skill set being up to date. And then you can compete for sure. All right, we have uh, right down here. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mai Perkins, and I'm here in Hong Kong for a two-month internship with New School University. Um, I'm actually in a grad I'm mid-career transitional. You know, I'll say this: I'm in a um, graduate program, in international affairs, with a concentration in media. And so, I guess, um, like, I know what my strengths are as a writer, as a like qualitative researcher, as you mentioned, and um, I have a few notes here. You know, I've, I've worked as an educator. I've worked in marketing, advertising. Um, you know, I have a passion for the fine arts, for travel, all these different things. And so I find that um, honing in on, like, when you can do many things, like honing in on one thing to, like, make the career, you know, tends to clutter your mind space and make it hard for you to say, okay, well, at this point, this is what I'm working towards, you know. I don't even know that really one should, at this point, look for one thing that they're doing. You know, do you do one thing well or do you do a bunch of different things in order to have a sustainable income, in a matter of speaking? And so, um, I mean, that's basically what my question boils down to. And even when you ask the question, well, are careers serendipitous? Or are they planned? You know, for me, being 35 years old, I feel like most of the jobs that I've had have been more serendipitous, you know. And the higher paying careers, or not careers, but the higher paying jobs that I've had, I've quit because I didn't, I didn't like the job and I was tired and stressed out. So I said, you know, forget all of this. I'm going back to graduate school to, you know, I'll get a PhD and then figure it out, you know. And so, you know, that's basically, you know, in a, rambling nutshell <laughs> what my question is the question's on the, the, the question is when you when you feel like you can do a number of things to make a living but you aren't really making a living sustainable living at any one thing how do you should you try to hone in on one thing or you know should, should you try to <laughs> juggle all the plates on your fingertips and kind of see what happens you know so there's a, I think it's a great question because I think there's a lot of us in the room that, you know, we can do so many different things and it's like, what's the one thing that I'm going to do? And then there's a reality that you do need to, to pay the bills. You need to, you need to make money, right? So there's a beautiful book out there that Reed Hoffman wrote. Uh, it's called Startup You. I, I, I highly recommend it. I've read it. It's great. And he's got a little model there that I kind of borrowed and changed and it's called, it's a career, I think 
I don't know if he calls it a career model, but I do. So there's a macro condition. So what's going on in the world right now? Mm -hmm. Then there's your skills. What skills can you do? And then what I put in our, uh, on my little model is what's your aspirations? And I actually think if you look at all three constantly, you can try to figure it out. You do need to hone in on something. Because when you're going to go, like Kevin Stiles said, if you're going to pitch a story, what is your what's your pitch a story about you? So, so if we're going to hire you, what are you going to tell us about you that would make us want to hire you? So I, I'm a big believer is you got to get your story down and it has to be authentic and it has to be real. And in that sense, you need to, you need to kind of hone it in, right? Uh, you sound like you have a fabulous background and which is very much linked to what's going on, the whole international component. You've had a PR background, all of that. I mean, that works perfectly well for journalists. So what media? Would it be online media? Would it be digital media? Would it be television? You know, so there's also, we can talk after this if you want to, but I do think you need to look at what's going on in the world, what are your skill sets, and what are you, what are you interested in? I, I steer away from the word passion, although I do believe in it, but I, I have to tell you, when I give talks and say, what's your passion? Some people go, oh, oh my God, I, like, I can't even think that far. So what, do you, what, do, what does success feel like? What, what's your aspirational goal? And what do you want to get after you do this degree? Like you went there for some reason. You've, you've got something in your mind. So I think you have to have, it's kind of funny. Be, get something that you want to do, but also know that you can be adaptable. Why are you? Start up you. Yeah, just Google Reed Hoffman. I think he was, he might have been on Bloomberg just recently mm. on, on this whole. He set up um, LinkedIn. So earlier today in one of the sessions, we heard that first impressions are made. Can anybody guess? Is it in the first 30 seconds? Is it in the first 10 seconds? Or is it in the first three seconds? What's the answer, you think? Three seconds. That's all you got. Do you know your story? If I met you right now, in three seconds, I make a snap judgment on you. What impression are you going to make on me? Are you clear on it? Are you clear on your authentic voice? What is it? Abigail, if for those of us who don't know, how do we get there? Yeah, I mean, I think something I would on that topic that I would really recommend watching is, um, I'm sure you've seen lots of the different TED Talks. I don't know if anybody's seen the TED Talk that Amy Cuddy does, C-U-D-D-Y, about we are our body language and the incredibly powerful ability that we have to influence other people but also influence ourselves through our body language. So we were talking about your friend earlier and that lack of confidence, which is, is almost endemic in successful people because you have different scales of capability and you have people that are very comfortable in that powerful, assertive, dominant position. And then a lot of other people perhaps aren't using as much of the testosterone hormone and don't have that confidence. And your body language can be very, very powerful in creating an impression for other people, but it can also be an incredibly useful tool that you can use for yourself. So she, as an advocate of the most simple tool, uh, all scientifically backed, she's, she works at Harvard and she's a social psychologist. And she is an advocate of something called the two-minute power pose. And depending on the generations in the room, that looks something like either Wonder Woman or Beyonce is, I think, probably more of a, more of a modern example. And, and it was scientifically proven that standing in an assertive, dominant, more powerful position, it can be behind the cubicle door in the bathroom, for two minutes can really, really help you create a very, very positive physical, so using the visual components of the impression you give. But it can also change your own physiology. And if you're not feeling that confident, but you're going into an evaluative process, maybe it's an interview and you need to be at your best, but you're not feeling that confident, it's a really, really great tip. So maybe that's something that you could have a look at. It's a TED Talk by Amy Cuddy. Yeah, it's great. And she's a really interesting woman that's had an interesting career track. So that would be a piece of advice. I love it. One on one, go. Hands up. OK, back there. Glasses. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. I'm Dancy. I want to ask the question about different education background in the Korea. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to say I'm really uh, clear about my career plan. I want to be a data journalist, a journalist who can use data to tell a story. Um, back to my education background. Um, previously, I studied electrical engineering, but I really want to be a journalist. So I study uh, the next uh, major is communication and media. Uh, previously, uh, after graduation, uh, I do data-driven social media project in JMSC in Hong Kong U. After that, when I seeking job position, it's really not easy for me to get a job in news agency. Then, how, how to say that, just help the journalist to do some data analysis or visualization. That's what I really want, but it's not easy for me to get a position like that. I'm going to go Hollywood on you because I, I know that um, you're, you're casting yourself, and they're casting for the role, and the role is journalist. And you come in here, and you're a former engineer who studied, so you have a skill set, but that's it. It's like you're casting yourself for a role that you're halfway there for. How do you get to convince them? So here's the analogy. Hollywood director looking for an actress to play this blonde cheerleader who's uh, going to kill vampires. And in walks this wonderful actress, and she fits all the right moves and the attitude, and she embodies that role. But there's something about her, and they're not sure. And they go back, and they call up her agent, and they say, you know, she's great, but she's not quite right. So the agent goes back to the actress and says, can you dye your hair blonde? She comes back, does the re-audition. They love it. That's it. She's the blonde cheerleader who's going to kill the vampires. She had it all along. She just needed to dye her hair blonde. Sometimes help them see you. So what are the check marks that you need to do to be the journalist in their organization? You figure that out, and you get the experience that fits that, and you'll get that role. That's the, from the news advice. Jane and Abigail? Yeah, I was thinking that um, a little bit differently. I was thinking that you know what their resistance is going to be, right? I'm an engineer, da 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 da, da. I've done this, da da, da da So go in with uh, answering those questions. You may think I'm an engineer in this, but let me show you what I can do this, and here's why. So. It's more of a consultative approach and, and understanding exactly what you said. Who, who's on the other side of this hiring scene? What are they looking for and how do you solve the problem for them? Yeah, and I think further to that, it, it, it is the hardest step, you know, when you don't have the actual experience in the industry you want to go into, but you've got the academic qualification. So you, you can position yourself with all the transferable skill sets and capabilities that you know they're looking for. And then really it comes down to doing as much as you can, whether it's in a volunteer capacity, a pro bono capacity, on, a, on your own private blog, purely to build up your reference points, to create a portfolio and a network that you can use to support you. You know, because it is the hardest step and you have to do everything you can to dye your hair blonde. <laughs> Yep, yep. And the other thing is that that, article, that show that Mike Bloomberg did is when you go there, you work really hard and you take on the assignments that maybe somebody doesn't want to do and you do it really well and, and, and you show them that you can do it. I think that was a great yep. Right over here. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Valencia and um, I was just wondering, just now you were talking about first impressions and also, you know, uh, a lot of things you're talking about are about, uh, you know, the visual cues of how people perceive you. 
so because I'm I'm quite interested in the arts industry and you know journalism and all that. So I was wondering how this affects other industries, like in terms of career or no, I mean um, for visual cues, like. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, and because uh, she's an, as she just mentioned, she's from an engineering background. I think for, for engineering, it's more about you know skill versus um, you know like for me in the arts industry or here journalism, it's more about presentation. So, like if someone is uh, Asian and I don't have blonde hair and I dye my hair blonde, <laughs> I go in there and I cast for a role. Like does ethnicity or race or age or gender, that kind of thing come into play when it comes to... I, I was using that as a, yeah. a, a analogy. It's really not yeah, I'm visceral not really or anything like that. I think, I think the, the, the story really is nobody's doing you a favor. I mean, how many of you have gone into a job interview and said, well, I really want to be this? And the person staring back at you is saying, oh, well, I'm not your guidance counselor. I'm trying to figure out what I'm trying to do for the best for my newsroom. So I need somebody who can do this, 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 and this. I'm not here to do you any favors or give you the job lottery. What can you do for me? So if you can flip that thinking around, that's really what I'm, that, that was the analogy really that I was, Doing. So would that be like the, um, you sh uh, your advice would be to think in a way that the recruiters would think and exactly. try to see what kind of qualities they're looking exactly. for. Exactly. Yeah, and there's a massive difference between somebody that comes into, whether they're meeting you know, a recruiter or whether they're meeting the person doing the hiring, between somebody that comes in and says, let me tell you why I'm good for this job, and this is all the things that I have, and these are some of the things that I don't have, but let me tell you how I'm going to get them. And somebody that comes in saying, am I good enough for this job? Do you think I can do this job? Will you give me this job? It's the perception piece. Do you think, I mean, also for NG, do you think culture has a part to play? Because there's a tendency for Asians to be quite self-depreciating, right? Uh, they don't like to play up themselves. I mean, I'm stereotyping, right? But that seems to be the case. That seems to be the case in a... I mean, uh, in, I, I'm a Singapore-based journalist, and among my peers, that's the case. We don't, you know, like to play ourselves up that much. So, I mean, just y your views on that. Yeah. Well, I think, Jane, you can answer this as well, because I think companies need to recognize that in Asian cultures, that this is what happens. Um, that you do have to look at somebody's experience and portfolio and see and let their work speak for themselves. So as companies, we, we have to be sensitive to that. It is also our responsibility. You're a damn journalist. You stand up and you advocate for your stories, but you're a shy little mouse in the job interview. What does that say about how you're going to conduct yourself in the field? You're not being the best representative of your work right now. Get over it. Get over these cultural divides that have stopped us for so long. We recognize that this is what we do. Stop it. Overcome it. There's a balance, obviously. I mean, we, we can't take 100% responsibility. But it is a move on both sides to somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I just want to add to that. There's a, there's a, as I said earlier, um, I work a lot in diversity and inclusion, and there's this huge push. It's not only um, culture and gender, but also uh, multi generational workforces. So it addresses what you were saying earlier too. Um, as organizations are knowing know that, look, the workforce is incredibly diverse right now, and how do we take this talent and and, and, and be inclusive with it. And I, I believe that organizations are building an awareness around what I call unconscious bias. It's not, it's not, we, you know, it's not this, that say Disney or CNBC or um, Bloomberg would write down, you have to be, you have to do this, this, and this. It's just unconsciously they might gravitate towards somebody who is more direct or somebody is who is more outspoken. But if you have somebody who has an awareness of differences, and those differences can be very powerful in a newsroom, drive performance, drive innovation, drive a different type of a story, 
that I, I think they are aware of it. Um, I think you need to be who you are, but also you need to understand, back to your question earlier about what is the recruiter, and I would go beyond the recruiter. I would go for who's making that decision on the hire. What does that person want and need? What are they looking for? How do I solve that problem for them? And how do I let them know that I do that in my own style? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my side. Hello, um, Sharon Chan from the Seattle Times. I wanted to ask if, um, uh, well, one of the things Sheryl Sandberg talks about in her book, Lean In, is how when she's assertive, she's seen as bossy, whereas when a man is assertive, he's just doing his job. So I think one of the questions that, one of the things I feel like might be helpful is if you talked about how you can be assertive about talking up your own value without seeing arrog arrogant or boastful. Because I have to say that I have run into a situation where I'm working with Asian American journalists who are upfront about saying their, what their accomplishments are. And then later on, I hear other white managers saying like, oh, he tries to take credit for everything. <laughs> and I don't think they would say that about a white manager. So how do you balance that? Like being, um, talking up who you are while not going over the top. So I always advocate um, talking about what you do and the impact on the organization, right? So I went out and ran this story with my team of, you know, from Cambodia and Japan and Korea, and we came back with this story, and here's the view that we had on it, and here's the impact that story had on Bloomberg, and look at the how many eyeballs we got on that story. So I would always talk about what I do through the impact of the organization. So whatever that product is that I'm solving for, or I have if I'm a news, it's not about I, 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 it's about the value to the organization. That takes away all of that sort of, oh, um, taking credit and that sort of thing. I also think there's a challenge with Sheryl Sandberg's leaning in, particularly with in an Asian environment where, so I'm almost gonna contradict myself, there is a bias against how collectively how Asians should behave, right? And, 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 and some organizations will put all Asians together when we all know that the cultures are different. And because that mental bias or mental thought process is in inside organizations, if Asian women, I will say this, start leaning in, what's the response that they get? Too aggressive, too, you know, too, too bossy, all of that. So, so you, that's why my, the work that I do is an unconscious bias inside organizations to help them see these differences. So I think one is talk about what you do through the value of, of the organization, what you're delivering on, and then to make organizations, what I do, aware of unconscious bias. Abigail, do you have any strategies on how to craft your message so that it's received? Yeah, I mean, I think it is very, very challenging. It is one of the difficulties in the landscape we're currently in, this kind of gender differentiation and you know you don't get men called bossy and that is that is a real challenge that, that women looking to promote themselves looking to progress face I think what Jane said is, 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 is brilliant and and I think the only thing I would add to it is that really being very conscious about always striking the balance between your professional and your human persona and not trying too hard to create a professional persona that can be misinterpreted. So being being real and authentic and being inclusive and wherever possible, recognizing a collective effort, the contribution of others, the end result can take a little bit of the edge off that perception. But it is a difficult path to navigate at the moment. And I think organizationally work needs to be done to really try and 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 take the edge off some of those challenges that women face. We have time for one more one on one. And who is it going to be? It's going to be you. Um, hi, my name is Kirsten Peterson. I'm a Danish journalist, but uh, also studying right now. I took a risk in my career and quit my job that I didn't like. And then I uh, moved to New York and uh, start, started studying. But now I'm in a place in my life where I'm going back to getting a career, I'm finishing my studies, and I'm also starting a family. So I was wondering how do I make myself uh, attractive to an employer when also being in that stage of my life where I 
am going to have babies, and small children. Because I guess that's not exactly a quality that uh, an employer might want. I, I would argue differently. I think organizations are incredibly aware right now, and maybe you can say, say something different, but I, I work in, like I said, in diversity and inclusion, and it really doesn't make a difference whether, first of all, no organization would ask you, do, are you going to get married? Are you going to have children? That's not, those questions aren't going to be asked, how many children you have. And so I think they're just more aware. And uh, when I was at Disney, we hired people who were six months pregnant, seven months pregnant. It, it didn't make a difference. So I don't think that makes a difference at all. It's more finding your balance. <laughs> yeah, I, I would focus more on, on you because you can tie yourself up in knots trying to anticipate what they may or may not think, how they may or may not approach it. All you can do is work out what's the balance you want, what's the right professional environment for you to be able to get the balance that you want. And balance for everybody means very different things. But then to focus on the advantages that that brings to you in terms of your enhanced perspectives, in terms of your ability to really prioritize, because let's be honest, you have to more than you have ever had to before. And really try and focus on the positives, the attributes, the strengths that this will bring to the next chapter of your life and your career. But prioritize what you need don't try and fit somebody else's you know pre predefined kind of model you are who you are at the stage you're at with the skills you've got you present that in the best way you can and find a job that fits that yep. thank you for sharing your stories thank you for having the courage to speak about yourself and sharing it with the group thank you Jane Jane Horan of the Horan Group. That's how you look up Jane. She's got five books she's going to give away uh, to some fantastic questions out there. And um, Jane will find you. Abigail, thank you so much. Dramatic Difference is the Hong Kong-based company, executive coaching, top CEOs and people who have no idea what they want to do all come to you. Um, and I would just say to all of you, thank you for joining us. The journey is a tough one, but don't let yourself be your own worst enemy. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>